All right, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Brad Hurst coming at you again. Uh, as promised, I have a, a video update uh, that's kind of interrupting what we were doing with regard to the great apostasy. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, sometime earlier, this is actually an events-driven type of update uh, um, procedure that I'm doing on, on YouTube. And I just wanna make sure that uh, um, we try to keep you guys up to date with with what's going on in Afghanistan. Now, if you wanna know, have updates about actually what actually is going on in Afghanistan, you can certainly look at your, your news and uh, your internet and whatever you know, devices that you've got to go look at that. So I'm not trying to tell you what's you know, specifically going on in the ground. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help us make sense of it all from a biblical perspective. As I mentioned, if there are issues that are going on in the world that, that could possibly have a connection uh, with Bible prophecy, we want to take the time to stop and look at that. But the one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to um, necessarily go out there and try to find something and try to make it fit. So, um, all right. So, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be in a, a PDF that's going to be um, a link is going to be provided for that below this video. I would encourage you to get that PDF and read it because it's going to elaborate a lot more than what I can actually do in this video. Um, and I want you to read that PDF, folks. I mean, actually actually read it. That PDF is the same PDF that I had mentioned uh, uh, in, the, in my update video uh, that I gave to a couple of guys who read it and said that you know, it was quite overwhelming. And even though, even though they acknowledged that it had a better fit and seemed to historically fit better, <laughs> even having read it, they just kind of kept going with their old system. And that's kind of one of the problems we run into today. Uh, let me correct, it's not the same exact PDF. I, I've modified it a little bit and put some addendums in there uh, to try to bring it up to speed and bring it up to date. But uh, essentially it, it's the same information. So please read that, okay? Uh, I, I have one already on, on uh, internet already. I'm going to go ahead and take that one off and replace it with this one. And so uh, you guys will be kind of like the first group of people reading the updated version. I read it, all right? Don't be lazy, all right? You need, to, you need to turn your TV set off. You need to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing that's distracting you. And I would, I would encourage you to go ahead and read that. Uh, the purpose of the PDF is simply just to go to give you a, a very big, broad picture of history and show how, how we have a better paradigm with regard to uh, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, um, and uh, Revelation 13 and other passages of scripture, other passages of scripture that provide a better fit for us with regard to what's going on in the Middle East. Um, so I want to cover some of that in here to try to help answer some of the questions immediately. But again, please don't use this to skip your responsibility to get informed and, and read, that, uh, read that PDF. So uh, um, lots gone on since last Friday, actually. A uh, lot's gone on even uh, since I did my um, promo video, and I, I've kept up to speed. As of now, I probably have some 25 different articles that I've read through and logged and what have you. But there's one article in particular in the Christian Post that I, I uh, going to take time. I'm not going to read the article, but I'm going to kind of give you the uh, the summation of it. And it was a, an article that was uh, quoting different evangelical leaders from around the world. Uh, trying to figure out sort of what happened or what, 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 what's been going on and why did this happen and how did this happen and, you know, where's our president and all this and, and, and what have you. And in addition to that, some other things that, that I've um, looked at is some of the intelligent statements that are out there that can be made public stating that they, you know, they, they, they claim that they had no idea, you know, about that this was actually going to happen. And, that, that's quite possibly true, but they, they had no idea. And, and there's, I think that there's actually reasons for it. If you excuse me, just a minute, I'm going to kind of adjust my lighting a little bit here because uh, I realize it's actually getting a little bit darker. So, so I, I, I think that that's actually true. It's actually true that they probably didn't know what was going on. And I, there's, I, there's a very solid biblical reason why, why that's the case. So I don't fault them. Uh, what I do fault is the church. For not knowing, for not understanding what's been going on, and uh, we should be the ones to know. But uh, for whatever reason, you know, for a lot of reasons, actually, we we don't know, and we want to try to kind of give you a better paradigm through which to uh, think through some of these things. So, there, yeah, that's better lighting. 
So, so anyway, um, I, let's just kind of start looking in, in the book of Daniel, all right? In my paper, I spent a lot of time talking about Daniel chapter two, and I, I spent some time talking about Daniel, Daniel seven. Um, then I have some addendums, you know, that, that uh, uh, expand further on the original paper itself. So uh, I, I, again, I encourage you to just go ahead and, and look at that. Uh, if you could do that, that'd be great. But, uh, you know, in, in Daniel chapter two, we have a very specific vision. It's kind of like a vision, a broad vision of world history from a prophetic perspective. It's, it's, gonna, it's a vision of history uh, uh, before it's happened, all right? That's, that's kind of where, where, where we're at with Daniel chapter two. And you can go ahead and read it. I use the King James Version. I would encourage you to read it in the King James Version, but uh, whatever version you've got, go ahead and read it. Uh, but Daniel chapter two is, is very specific and it has some very, very uh, specific details regarding events that would lead up eventually to the second advent. And if you know the vision, you know, then this is rudimentary for you somewhat, but not, I encourage you to go ahead and read it. But in Daniel chapter two, we're talking about a, a, an image in Daniel chapter two. And this image is made up of several different metals, starting with the head down into the chest and arms of silver and then the, the, the belly and thigh of brass, and then the, the legs and feet of iron, and then uh, the feet in, of iron and, and clay, all right? And one of the things you have to understand is that uh, we're given the interpretation in the passage itself. We're told that, you know, of course, uh, Babylon is, is the, the head of gold. It was a very wealthy kingdom. And I, I believe that's really the only reason why it's actually uh, talked about in, current, in terms of being gold. The, the image is top heavy. Uh, it's designed to fall over, which eventually it will do. But uh, the, um, the first metal there is, is actually gold. And we know and right in the passage, that's actually talking specifically about, about the king of Babylon at the time, which was Nebuchadnezzar. And he's told after that, that an inferior kingdom is going to come, but it's also a wealthy kingdom, right? We find out that this is the Medo-Persian uh, kingdom, and we find out that uh, I think it's the fourth king in the Medo-Persian Empire uh, was one of the wealthiest kings to ever, ever live. Uh, it was a very, very wealthy empire. So the first two kingdoms, um, gold and silver, uh, nobody's going to argue that that's talking about Babylon and, and Medo-Persia, the Persian Empire eventually taking over. And then we get into the, the, um, the belly and thigh of, of brass. Now, what's interesting about brass is brass is a, it's a metal alloy. It's a mixture of, of different metals, copper and zinc. And um, it's, it's very malleable. You can beat it into different shapes and what have you. And it's, it's somewhat durable as well, all right? And what's interesting about this particular kingdom is that we're told that this kingdom is going to bear rule over all the earth. That is very important. It's going to be very important when we get into looking at the animals in Daniel chapter seven, right? We have to keep in mind that this kingdom is also a mixed kingdom, all right? It's not, it's not pure like gold. It's not pure like silver. It's actually a mixed kingdom. That's very important. We understand uh, later on that, that this kingdom, or we understand this passage, is this kingdom is going to bear rule over all the earth. Then we have another kingdom that comes after that. This other kingdom says that this this uh, kingdom is a kingdom of iron, and it breaks in pieces everything before it, and it, it uh, exists in, in two parts, both sides of the legs. And then as it continues to exist, just like the legs kind of get thinner and thinner and thinner, that this kingdom gets smaller and smaller. And eventually this kingdom is divided up into 10 toes. And that particular kingdom is, is uh, um, got strength and a weakness in it. And it's in the days of that kingdom that the God of, the God of heaven is going to come and set up his kingdom. And that's typified by the throwing of the rock, hitting it in the feet, the whole thing falling over, and uh, the rock itself uh, filling the whole earth. So that is very, very uh, straightforward about uh, what we've got going on. So here, but here's what's interesting, okay? Uh, there's, a, there's a Hebrew um, uh, structure in Hebrew writing, specifically when you're talking about Hebrew poetry. poetry don't, you cannot take poetry to think of it like the way that we do here in the West. Their poetry was completely different. It was not, it was not romantic. It was not emotive or, or contemplative or intuitive or anything like that. 
Okay, it was not to be reflective or anything. Poetry in Hebrew literature was designed to drive a point home, all right? And the way, the most common feature about poetry is uh, in Hebrew literature is uh, parallelism, okay, repetition. And the purpose of the parallelism, the repetition, is to cover points that weren't originally expressed in the first statement. You can have parallelism within the same sentence, with uh, repetition in the same sentence. You can have um, in, in the same paragraph, you can have it in the same chapter, you can have it in the same book, and you can also have it uh, crossing from book to book. What I mean by that is, is that over here, you might have a statement, and then somewhere over here, you have another statement that has clear links back to the original statement, but it contains, it, it contains additional information. And then over here, you have another statement and then another statement. And with each statement, you're getting more and more details about what was originally stated in the original statement. So the first original statement might be kind of broad and it grows more and more narrow over time, or it might be somewhat narrow and then more detail is added as, as time goes on. So that's, that's Hebrew poetry. And when you're talking about Bible prophecy, you're talking about using Hebrew poetry and you're using parallelism. So Daniel chapter two is sort of the biggest, the broadest statement. And we're talking about four different kingdoms. We got gold, silver, brass, iron, okay? And then eventually that one breaking up into uh, uh, iron and clay in the, in the toes, all right? So now we're gonna get into Daniel chapter seven, all right? And this is where it gets pretty important. So in, in Daniel chapter seven, what's interesting about Daniel chapter seven is, is that we have, instead of metal imagery, and there is some metal imagery in there, we have animal in, imagery. And, and this is incredibly important for us to understand because there's, there's a lot being stated here when, with this type of animal in, imagery. The first animal is mentioned in Daniel seven is, is a lion. And we're told that it's it's Babylon. All right, we we just know that right off the bat. Uh, the second animal that is is mentioned is 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 a bear, and we know through history that that's actually um, we know through history that that's actually a uh, um, the Medo Persian Empire. All right, bear rising up on one side, eating three ribs or having three ribs in his mouth, being told to devour much flesh and what have you. Then the third. Uh, animal imagery we have is a is a leopard with with wing, with wings. All right. Then the fourth beast, as it is, is a beast that's got ten horns, which connects us back to to ten toes. But this particular a beast has a claws of iron, a claws of of brass, and it also has um, um, iron teeth. All right. So some of the things that we could we can connect maybe back to that is some back to Daniel chapter two is the, the brass and the iron, the ten horns and what have you. All right. So there could be some, some similarities with that. In other words, maybe this beast is going to bear rule over all the earth and it's going to have in it the uh, power of iron in it as uh, as much as the the other um, uh, iron features are in, in Daniel chapter two. But I, but I want to take some time here to draw out something concerning the lion. In Babylon, they would have been um, very familiar with, with what is known is as the Asiatic lion, okay? It looks every much as much just like, like an African lion. It's, it's a slightly bit smaller, but it's, it's, it, it would be able to breed with an African lion, all right? Very much like an African lion. What is interesting about the Asiatic lion is when you take the territory that this lion lived in, all right, it's demographic, it's geographic territory, and you compare it with the, the shall we say, the territory of, of the uh, Neo-Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar, um, the territories match, all right? In other words, the, the habitat, territorial habitat of the Asiatic lion uh, is almost a perfect match with the known boundaries of ancient Babylon, the Neo-Babylon Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Right? It's I've got that documented in the in the PDF. You can go and have a look at that. 
The next thing that we have is we have the bear, all right? This bear uh, is universally understood to be talking about the Medo-Persian Empire. And ironically, uh, the bear that they would have been familiar with is what we know as the Syrian brown bear. And just like the Asiatic lion, the habitat, the territorial habitat of the Syrian brown bear is almost a perfect match uh, matching up to the known boundaries of the Medo-Persian Persian Empire. All right, again, go look at it in the, in the PDF that I've provided a link for below and you can see it in there in the addendum. The next uh, uh, animal is a leopard with wings. Now, leopards aren't known to be fast. You know, they can, they can run about, they, they can run a short distance and they can explode from zero to, you know, 34 miles an hour in, in a split second. That's about 54 feet a second. Um, but they're not known to be fast, but they have explosive power and they can, they can go from zero to 34 miles an hour very quickly. And uh, leopards are very stealthy. Uh, they ambush their prey, they, they stalk their prey. They're capable of being able to, um, uh, they're, they're, they're capable of being able to take down animals many times bigger than them and even drag them up in the trees and, and save them there for you know, a, a feast later on. Um, and they, what's interesting about leopards is that they have a very large habitat. In fact, they have one of the largest habitats in the world in terms of animals. Uh, in the ancient world, they were known to be from uh, from the uh, from the Atlantic coast on North Africa, all the way across North Africa, up into parts of Asia Minor, part of the parts of Greece, and parts of Southern Europe. Uh, they continued uh, into into Saudi Arabia, down around the Arabian Peninsula, uh, through Saudi Arabia into India, and uh, uh, <clears throat> as far east as as uh, as China and uh, Southeast Asia, a very, very large habitat. And what is interesting is, is that when you actually look at the, the empire under Alexander, Alexander had, had an empire that essentially ran from the Atlantic coast, North Africa, uh, into Italy, into Sicily, into parts of Southern France, parts of Spain, what have you, colonies, what have you through Greece, through Turkey, through the Middle East, through Mesopotamia, all the way uh, down into the Arabian Peninsula on both sides, and then into, uh, into India. In fact, there was almost, I just keyword word there, almost no place uh, uh, that the, uh, Alex, the, the, the Grecian Empire, in other words, there was wherever the Grecian Empire went or was at, you almost always had leopards there. All right, and uh, this is important because we're we're told that this beast that comes in later on it has brass nails. It seems to be indicating that it too is going to have a a a uh, dominion over the over the earth as well. I'm not going to get into all the details of of Daniel chapter seven because I want to do get I want to get to what we're actually currently dealing with. Now Daniel seven does talk about another beast. All right, and uh, just like like uh, the the, the uh, iron legs of of Daniel 2 are telling us about a, a fourth kingdom as it is. There's another fourth king. There's a, there's a fourth kingdom mentioned in Daniel 7, and it's, it's this beast. It has iron teeth and it has brass legs. And so it does have connection back to Daniel chapter 2. And it does seem to indicate that this, this beast is going to quite possibly, like, like Greece, um, have bare rule over all the earth. All right. So most people want to take Daniel chapter two and the iron legs, Daniel chapter seven and the beast with the 10 horns and the iron teeth and the brass legs, brass are the brass, brass uh, nails. They want to make that be wrong. All right. There's a lot of problems with that. Okay. You can actually read more about that in the PDF listed down below. But you have to understand that the way that these empires are set up, okay, in Daniel two and Daniel seven is, is that. One, man, one empire rises, another one comes, smashes that empire, takes up over that area and its territory and its domain. Then 
Another empire rises, grabs all that one, gets bigger, gets bigger and bigger with each one. So that each, each successive empire is bigger, more powerful than the one that it's actually replacing. Now, if you're gonna try to make quote unquote grown actually be uh, the iron legs and the, the beast of, of Daniel chapter seven, you have to understand that we're told specifically in Daniel seven that the beast mentioned there uh, basically crushes everything in its path, all right? That the previous empires are just, I mean, it basically just tramples down everything. The problem you have with that is that, is that A, number one, Rome, which I think is just an extension of Greece, Rome never conquered more than half. It, it conquered less than half of what would have been, in, in the minds of other thinkers, what would have been the Grecian Empire. In other words, the Grecian Empire was twice the size as Rome. It just was. It was twice the size of, as Rome that Rome ever was. And Rome never set foot in Persia. Rome doesn't fit. In fact, what people need to understand is that Rome, as well as the Parthian Empire, were basically, basically continuations of, of Greece. Uh, you have to understand is that when we, when we talk about that leopard and how adaptable the leopard is, and the leopard uh, is a very adaptable animal, and also that the, the brass, that is actually a, a mixed uh, metal. The, the Greece, Greece is a, was an empire that adapted and changed and morphed uh, from, from location to location and from, from historical point to historical point. At one point in time, you know, as Greece began to, to, to break up and it went off into the four generals under Alexander, uh, you had the Seleucids, you had the Ptolemies, you had uh, other divisions and what have you. Eventually, uh, the Roman section basically united the whole Western portion of, of what would have been the Grecian Empire under a, a Roman banner. And then in, in Parthia, the same thing happened over there. And so you still had portions of the Greek, Greek Empire continue to exist in different forms in different places. And like a leopard, it was, it was adaptable. And it was a, a, an empire of many cultures of, and of, of many territories. It's, it's almost comical to watch people try to make Rome fit, all right? You have to insert, you know, gaps and you have to use eisegesis and you have to try to, you know, place everything in, in, in Europe as far as the ten toes and what have you. And, and, and it, just, it just doesn't fit. Again, there's more information on that, you know, when you look at the, uh, Look at the PDF down below. So uh, I, I, it just I, it just doesn't fit. But if you actually understand history, which a lot of a lot of pastors don't, a lot of pastors don't, a lot of Christians don't understand history. Excuse me, I got this fly flying around in here. They 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 just don't understand history, and the history is is much broader than than European history. There was a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East, a lot of stuff going on in in the East as well. That was taking place, you know, over time as well. But we tend to try to sort of, sort of, kind of like Europeanize our our biblical prophecy. And if there is a European element, then we certainly want to look at that. But we don't, we don't want to get caught into trying to make something fit because in, so in doing that, if we're trying to make something fit and it doesn't fit, we end up getting stuck in these paradigms, and we we're not able to get ourselves out of them, even even though there might be, you know, a more shall we say. Um, sober, uh, a more sound uh, understanding of, of what has taken place. So that's just something we just want to keep, make sure that we stay away from. Now, uh, let me just kind of digress here a little bit into history, all right? Greece, essentially, from, from 232 BC, uh, continued to morph and to adapt and to adjust and so forth over time. Most of that information is found in the PDF listed below, okay? But Greece had the ability to morph and to adapt. Well, if you look at history, all right, if you look at history, Greece really did not fall until 1454 AD with the fall of Constantinople. It just didn't. That was the, that was the fall of Greece. 
And in its place came up an empire that existed in two forms. It's Islam, right? More details in the PDF, but, it, but it, it, essentially it was, it was Islam that came up. And as Islam came up, it existed in two forms. Safavid, uh, Shia, that would be Iranian, Persian, and then Sunni, uh, Turkish, all right, which would be the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire and the, together with the Safavid Empire, created the largest empire ever to know, to be known to man. From North Africa up into uh, Central, Central Asia, uh, into the gates of Vienna, up into Spain and France, across North Africa, into the Middle East, uh, into India, all the way down into Indonesia. It was a massive empire. It existed in two forms, all right? And it seemed to be, it seemed to be unstoppable. It seemed to just crush everything in its past, path. It certainly crushed all of Babylon. It certainly crushed all of Persia. And it certainly crushed all of what was known at the time, uh, what was once known as the Grecian Empire. And it expanded and was much larger. However, over time, both sides of the, of the uh, Islamic empires would eventually begin to shrink as a result of things going on in Europe and what have you. Europe was on, on the verge of collapse under Islam, but eventually they developed blue water navies and they were able to get around the Horn of Africa. And as a result of that, they were able to, they were able to get goods and start trading again with China because the Ottoman Empire together with the Safavid Empire uh, they what they were doing is, is they were they were taxing and, and and issuing these big huge levies on the spice trail that was coming from from China and from India the Silk Road and what have you into into Europe and and they were essentially taxing this and this is actually uh, how they were getting their revenues. Well, once once England and France specifically found a way to to develop blue water navies, they were able to engage in trade and start whittling away at those, those two legs of, of the empire. And eventually over time, they were, those two legs of the empire were reduced to their, essentially their mother areas. And after World War I, uh, France and Britain essentially broke those areas up into 10 nations. And those 10 nations are in existence today. They would be Turkey, if I remember these correctly, they'd be Turkey. They would be uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and if I remember correctly, uh, Qatar or Bahrain. Okay? It, it basically, in that, that breakup, that division took place over a course of about 50 years. But today, those, those kingdoms are there. They're still there. And what's interesting is, is, is um, uh, Turkey right now is actually trying to <laughs> uh, usurp Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. So folks, you can't make this stuff up, all right? You, you, just, you just can't make this stuff up. So what does, that, what does that leave us, you know, how does that help us out with understanding what's going on, on today? Well, again, more information in the in the uh, PDF below, but when you get to Revelation chapter thirteen, there's an inter interesting phenomenon that takes place there. And there's there's a beast there, and that particular beast uh, has some components in it that are very important for us to to understand. First, we're told that the beast itself is like a leopard. All right, that that takes us back to a Grecian component. In addition, that it also has the mouth of a lion. That takes us to somewhat of a Babylonian component. And, in a, and then in addition to that, uh, we're told it has the feet of a bear. Now, I do believe that this is telling us that this is, that we, that this is telling us uh, the geographical location of, of this beast, and that would actually be uh, Mesopotamia in the Middle East, all right? But the mere fact that it's actually telling us 
specific things about this beast. Its mouth, it's like a leopard, and its feet. It's very important for us to understand, okay? And it helps us to understand what's been going on in the last 40 years. Look, folks, you, you can't doubt in the last 40 years, Islam has just grown by leaps and bounds, starting with the Iranian revolution, all right? And what is funny about this is that each time this, this giant step forward by Islam takes place, it seems to catch the world by surprise. And everyone's like, man, we didn't know this. You know, we, this was supposed to be this. It was supposed to be this democracy. And all of a sudden, this is, this is what happens here. Well, understanding the imagery of rep, not only Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and other places as well in Daniel, uh, but also with Revelation chapter 13, it helps us to better understand what's been going on and maybe even what's gone on with Afghanistan, all right? We're talking about a beast here, and this beast has specific animal characteristics that help us pinpoint where its domain would be at, all right? But also how it functions as well. The first thing that we notice in Daniel or in Revelation chapter 13 is that this, this beast is like a leopard. Well, you look at the territory of a, leper, a, le a leopard at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, it could be telling us that this place, this, this, this beast has a very large domain, right? And if, if like in Daniel 7, it's got brass nails, it most likely has, has very large domain, all right? Well, well, okay, well, Islam does have a large domain. I mean, culturally speaking, even in places where Islam is, is not uh, the, the official government position at the time, right now, Islam has a very large domain, okay? And it has always had a large domain, even in times when it seemed to be on the wane, all right, culturally speaking. But in addition to this, you have to understand how a leopard hunts. A leopard um, stalks its prey and it ambushes its prey. It's not a very fast animal. Yeah, what it does, it will sit there and just wait until the right time when the animal itself is close enough and is not even suspecting anything going on, can't even see it, even though it is literally probably just a couple yards away. There are videos of leopards almost walking right up to their prey. <coughs> Excuse me just prior to pouncing on the prey, okay? This and this leopard, leopards can, can take down uh, animals that are several times larger than it, all right? So we're told that this, this beast is like a leopard, an animal that has a large uh, territorial habitat, okay? An animal that stalks its prey and waits for the right time, ambushes its prey, and an animal that can take down a, animals that are much larger than it. We're also told that this animal has a, a, uh, the mouth of a lion. Now, I had to do a little bit of research on that. And something I came across was is that a lion um, has the ability to, to roar. And its roar can be heard as far as five miles away. And the primary purpose, not the only purpose, but the primary purpose of a lion roaring is to tell other lions and other predators, get out of my territory. I, I, I gotta tell you, all right? The, the jihadis in the Middle East have been doing what they've been doing for the last 40 years, trying to drive the Westerners out, okay? They want to drive the infidel out of the, the Islamic lands. I'm just telling you, all right? And they have a tactic that they use in terms of actually being able to do that. It's actually terror. And they use, like a leopard, they tend to stalk and to prey their, their enemies, all right? Then you finally have, and this is what's, <laughs> this is what's really, really, I, I, this is really telling me, feet like a bear. 
Now I live in California and I've been in bear country most of my life. All right, I've seen bears in, in the wild. Um, they're, they're majestic animals. It's my favorite animal, you know, in the animal kingdom, I've got bear emblems all over the place. One thing is, is that this passage says that they have feet like a bear, all right? When a bear um, walks, it's flat-footed. And so when it actually steps, it does not leave a distinct mark. In other words, you can't tell that it's actually a bear track. The only way you would be able to do that is if it stepped in snow or in mud. But a bear can literally walk in the camp and walk out of the camp and you would never know it was ever there, all right? Now, here's what's kind of interesting. All right, when, when the Iranian revolution took place back in 79, the United States helped it. Jimmy Carter was the one, we, we, we've often referred to him as the father of modern day Islam, okay? But uh, uh, Jimmy Carter assisted that revolution thinking that he was gonna introduce democracy into Iran. But what he didn't realize is that, is that the, the leopard was sitting there waiting, waiting to pronounce at the right time. What they didn't know is that the, 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 the bear, this, this beast, it's like a leopard, like a bear, like a lion, okay? We didn't, that what they didn't know is that this, this beast was sitting in there, not leaving any tracks behind, lying in wait, and at the right time, ready to pounce on its enemies. And once it, once it got in the power, like a lion, it started telling the foreigners to get out of the, get out of the Islamic land, all right? That's what their jihad was all about, was to drive the foreigners out and try to create a, a Islamic revolution, specifically a Shia one, across the Middle East. Then in the uh, early 90s, when the Soviet Union fell, th this was supposed to be a democracy movement. All right, the United States engaged in this in this underhanding, this undermining procedure of the Soviets. And when the Soviet Union fell, what you didn't get was democracy. You all of a sudden you got all these Islamic republics that popped up, right? And they some of them wanted to to have a Western uh, a Western uh, relationship, but eventually Islam sort of kind of drove that out. Now you have Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all right? Kazakhstan, not so much, but eventually they'll, they'll eventually get there. And all of a sudden they started to Islamify and start trying to drive the Western influence out. Okay, the animal with the feet of the bear, the lion, the mouth of the lion, the, the what do you call it, the, uh, 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 like a leopard, just sat there and just, and just waited and waited for the right opportunity in the right time. And when the time came, we thought we were gonna get democracy, but we didn't. Instead, we got Islamic republics. Then comes Turkey. Turkey comes in and uh, all of a sudden Turkey elects this guy who's supposed to be a reformer and what have you. And he's supposed to be this great individual and he's supposed to lead Turkey into this great new era of development and what have you. And he's done exactly that, okay? We thought we were gonna get democracy with him. But instead, we have an Islamist, okay? An Islamist who has turned Turkey into a regional power, all right? And then, in the, in the, now, now when we look at, at Afghanistan, um, we have the, well, not Afghanistan, we have the Arab Spring that took place, all right? When the Arab Spring took place, you know, we thought that this was going to be, the democracy was going to come in, okay? All of a sudden, these Ba'athist, pseudo-Marxist regimes are starting to fall. And in, in their place, what did we get? We got these Islamic totalitarian governments with the exception of, of Egypt, all right? That's essentially what we've got, what we got. So that, that beast was there. It had walked in and walked out and walked around not leaving any tracks. It was lying in wait. And when the right time came and it was in power and it says, this is my domain, it started telling the Western nations and the foreigners to get out, all right? So now, look at Afghanistan. What has happened? Okay, we've been there for 20 years. We thought that we would build democracy. We thought that when, when the time came, we'd be able to leave and democracy would take over and democracy would flourish. It would be for a free society. 
But the beast just sat there and laid, like a leopard, it just sat there and laid in wait. All right? It just sat there. Okay? It didn't leave any tracks for us to, to notice what it was doing. Okay? And now that they've got the opportunity, now that they're in power, what are they doing? They're telling everybody to get out. They want everybody out. So it's it, from, from the rise of the Iranian Revolution through the fall of the Soviet Union, the rise of Turkey, the Arab Spring, Afghanistan, it's all one beast. All right? It's all, it's all one beast. And we're watching this beast rise. You know, when you read the intelligence reports and stuff like that, and they say, we never saw this coming. Well, that's exactly what Revelation would tell us, is that this, this beast would just, it would find a way that the, it would find its way in. You wouldn't see it coming. And when it had its opportunity, it would just spring on you and, and destroy you. And that's exactly what has happened. All right. That's, that's kind of where we're at. That's exactly what we see going on in Afghanistan. Now, there's a lot more information uh, regarding this, specifically in the Bible, stuff on the internet, and what have you. Uh, I, I really want you to go ahead and read that link that I've given you with regard to um, uh, um, uh, the PDF that I've, I've written down below it, to, to help you to explain it better to others. And ladies and gentlemen, we be honest with you, I, mean, I know there are still people who want to go looking at Rome. I, I, I just, for the life of me, I don't get that. Okay. It's, I, I've, I've got one person, she's a dear individual, who wants to say, well, you know, obviously this Islam thing is quite evident, but there must be a double prophecy now because she can't let go of Rome. Just like the, the guys who, who I talked to earlier this year were so overwhelmed by what they saw in, in the PDF, they couldn't, they couldn't refute it, but they still fell back on their Roman narrative. Well, I, I have to tell you, all right, what most people are looking for is they're looking for some of what's been said to be said by a celebrity pastor, all right, or a celebrity prophecy guy, you know, a Jack Hibbs or a Amir Safadi or anything like that. And I'm sure those are wonderful individuals and stuff. But to be, to be honest with you, I, I think that there's a lot of platitudes that those guys engage in, and, and um, I, I think they could actually do better. But uh, um, I want you to actually read this. I want you to read it. I want you to tell your friends about it. If you've, if you've got questions, I've, I've left my information in the PDF. You can contact me directly. I'd be glad to talk to you. There's a lot more to this than, than just what uh, I, you know, I've, I've talked about in here. But for the sake of brevity, you know, I realize that people, you know, they, they haven't been able to absorb this and what have you. But ladies and gentlemen, I, the 10 nations are there. <laughs> I mean, the legs of iron have been divided into 10 nations, okay? The, Ten horns have come out of, they've come out of the, you know, the the beast, and it's it, they're there, they're, they're they're there. It's in the days of those kings, okay, that the God of, of heaven is going to set up His kingdom. And if, as I've explained to you, is it, correct, and I believe it to be the case, I mean, we're on the precipice of some pretty, uh, in some cases, terrifying and fascinating things. I mean, look at the shock of the world. The shock of the world at what happened in Afghanistan. That wasn't supposed to happen. Imagine what would happen if Israel were to fall. Do you know that now, even now as, as we talk, Israel is now trying to negotiate a better relationship with Egypt. They're actually going down into Egypt even, even this week with the intent of trying to coordinate with Egypt in the event that Israel gets attacked. Israel's actually doing that. They're, they're coordinating information between them and their intelligence committee there. And there's, uh, there's, there's bio prophecy, you know, to be addressed with regard to that. Because at some point in time, we're told that Israel is going to fall and they're going to lean on Egypt. And Egypt's going to basically drop them like a hot potato. They're going to be a, a, a reed that Israel might, uh, leans on. And the Lord's going to destroy Egypt as a result of that. So there's a lot of information regarding Egypt. and I, I, Not Egypt, but Israel and, and Egypt as well. And, uh, and what happens with regard to Israel is also going to be an indicator of the nearness of the rapture. So uh, there's information regarding Israel that tells us that Israel at some point in time is going to fall as a nation. There's a reason for it. And it's prior to the rapture. Just imagine when that actually happens. And, and imagine, the look at the shock that we see even the evangelical community now, right, with Afghanistan. Imagine what would happen if Israel were to fall. 
So hopefully we can uh, address that before it actually happens. So uh, um, I'm gonna do what I can to try to stay, uh, keep you guys up to speed on this. Um, it's been very difficult to organize all this and to try to narrow it down and what have you. Very hard to actually do. Uh, I've got, as you can tell, I've got a new camera that I'm just now getting used to. Uh, and so it kind of keeps going in our focus. And I saw, I apologize for that. But I, I, I want you to understand that, that this is happening so fast. And uh, I'm going to do the best that I can to try to keep you all up to speed. And if something else comes up, you know, in the area of apostasy or in Israel, we're going to have to shift and kind of go over there at the same time. So uh, thank you for your time. Please uh, make sure to check that information out in the link and, and uh, uh, share this video. All right. And don't forget to subscribe. Have a good day.